Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. All right, joining us on the podcast is author and musician Josh Mellerman, who is uh, should not need an introduction to horror fans because he is the writer of one of the biggest horror sensations of the last couple of years, Bird Box. But we're going to talk about uh, a whole bunch of his different books. But we're going to start with talking about the 2014 World Horror Convention because that is where I first learned of Josh Mallerman because I was signing books like four tables down from Josh and there was constantly a line in front of our table <laughs> of people holding this book Bird Box and that I had not heard of before that convention and I remember I was signing with Anderson, Anderson Prunty and I turned to Anderson and I was like wow this Bird Box books everyone is talking about it I think I need to go home and read it. <laughs> Well, so what was the 2014 World Horror Convention like for you? That was my very first horror convention, my very first one, which sounds crazy now in only, well, I guess six years is a long time, but in only six years, it seems like there's been sort of an infinite, you know, um, flow of them. But that was the first one. And HarperCollins had given me a box of hardcovers to sell. So I had a box of like, 60 or something hardcovers of bird box first book coming out i don't know anyone there first convention and i walked over to that table we had tables as you said <laughs> and i was like what am i gonna do like sit here and like they, they had they had advised you could sell them for 10 20 dollars whatever and i and i was sitting there for one second and i'm like nobody knows who i am nobody knows what this is i'm giving i'm just gonna give these out for free so the reason you saw everyone with a copy of bird box is because I just stood up behind the table the whole time, and any time someone was like, you want a free hardcover? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. And I would hand them a bird box. You want a free hardcover? Sure. Like, so the next, like, 60 to 100 people that walked by, I just handed one out. So, but in hindsight, it's interesting, because in hindsight, that seems like almost accidentally the smartest thing I could have done, but I hadn't looked at that strategically at the time. It was just like, I, I, want, I want them to have it. I... I if they don't buy it, then what do I just have a box of my own book, right? Right. Well, so I was like, just give them out. Nobody knows who I let's and then but I see that now as almost some sort of like seed work. Because oh, was, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, and you know what's amazing is because the other writers, we were assuming you were selling them. Because right. we yeah, we just saw that everybody had these books and we thought we kept thinking like, wow, there there must be like amazing buzz about this book because everybody's walking around holding them. Well, and, so that's why as soon as I got, because it's funny because we had lived in Portland at the time and that was our, we were waiting for that convention and then we were moving back here to San Diego. Uh -huh. and, and so it took a little bit of time, like once I got back to San Diego, got a library card. And then the, one of the first books I got was Bird Box. And um, it, because it kept, I kept thinking about like the sensation of that. And it did work because everybody was reading and reviewing the book and getting around. So I do think that was important seed work. So, you know, no, uh, but now I find like myself like wanting to do that with every book, you know, like, like wanting to go to a convention with a box of Mallory's, which I have here because, because of the lockdown, like I, we haven't traveled. So yeah. we haven't had a reading or a signing. So I just have the box here. But I find myself either way, like wanting to just go somewhere, and just like here, 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 you know, take them, take them. Like there's, that, it's like, why should I feel any different now, right? I just want the book out there. But really, what it was with Bird Box was maybe an airport. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he goes stand outside. What do you want? No, no, I want to give you something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, take a and phone. then, um, but with Bird Box, really, the moment that the book seemed sort of welcome into the scene or something was Rocky Wood posted about it. He oh yeah that whatever he, he wrote something very flattering about it and that was like for me you got to see from my angle new to all this but had been writing for years decades even yeah but the scene 
Mm-hmm. And the president of the HWA writes this really flattering post about Bird Box. It was sort of like, oh, wow. Like, from my angle, like, this is, this is a big moment. And I think that's when that, right then, between that seed work and Rocky's post is when that book started to go somewhere. Well, you know, and, and it, the perception of it was funny because cause for Prunty and I, who were sitting at that table, we were, you know, we kept saying, like, man, there's all, this Mallerman guy's got this big line. And, and, and yeah, my first thought is somebody who's been in the horse scene for a long time was, I've never heard of this guy. Yeah. You know, no. and like, <laughs> and then, but I will say, and I want to talk about that first reading experience when we get into spoilers a little bit more about Bird Box. But, um, but I was instantly hooked. I instantly was like, I immediately knew that you had talent and that the hype was real. So at the, at, so at the same time, like, I, my first thought was, okay, okay, now I see why people were in line and all that. And, you know, and it's funny because now knowing the story that, that it happened that way, it's, it's yeah. even funnier, but brilliant. So well done, Josh. Um, yeah, as I almost feel like I, I tripped into that one. I, like, I didn't even, like, there was no strategy. It was like, I, I, no one's going to buy this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that world horror was great for me, too. Uh, I came in second in the um, gross out contest. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and I still feel I was robbed. Um, yeah, so I think the guy that won won because he was an old guy and everyone thought it was cute that this old guy was writing gross, a uh, gross story. However, um, <laughs> that world horror was, was, was really, um, and that was our last like big hurrah in Portland before we left. So I have a lot of fond memories of that world horror as well. But, um, now, did you read also? Did you do a reading at World Horror or you were just selling books? Because I know you had really produced and stylized readings that you did in the, in the past. Did you do one of those at World Horror? Or? No, I don't. No, I know we didn't because our first reading was ever was the night Bird Box came out and World Horror was before Bird Box came out. So okay. yeah, the very first reading we did was in like literally the night Bird Box came out Allison uh, read for Mallory. I think Allison and I read together. I'm not sure, but the audience was blindfolded. There, were, there's amazing photos from this. Um, my, I was playing in Oregon. My bandmates were playing weird music. Friends were involved. Allison was like sort of the center, like Mallory. Um, and there's, yeah, I had no idea. I, I just thought at the time that it was just a celebratory thing to do. Yeah, it wasn't until Black Man Wheel book two where I was like, huh, what are we going to do this time, you know? And <laughs> yeah. then, again, now, now it's like full, the one from Mallory, oh my God, was so, so there's a train that circles the Detroit Zoo. Uh, it can take you from the beginning to the end and vice versa. And there are two trains actually that go. So we had scheduled with the zoo that we were going to blindfold all the attendees on the train and then we would read through the PA and or the um, speakers when you got to the station at the other end of the zoo. So, and there would be a couple stops with scenes on the way. So you'd be blindfolded and then like, you know, you'd be listening while the train's going, you'd be listening to this scary story, right? And then it would stop and then you would, something would play out for you, a scene would play out, then you'd go, you'd hear another one and so forth. And at the end, everyone was going to be, you know, walked to the, what it was like, sort of essentially a movie theater at the zoo. And then there's going to be a full bar waiting there. And dude, I, I had spoken to Rue Morg about flying them in for it. And I mean, I was, we were really excited about this one. I understand a lot of people have, have um, dealt with a lot worse during this lockdown than not doing a reading. But that was, that was a big one for me. I was like, ah, that's like sort of the thing I, I yeah, lost. Like a great plan. Well, what's cool about you doing these kind of reproduced readings is that um, there's an art and science to reading that not every author figures out. Um, first off, like reading big blocks of text without dialogue or anything funny, you have to do funny stuff sometimes in readings because people get bored if there's not something happening. And what's smart about what you're doing is you're getting people into the story and having them live part of it. So you can't, you don't have to rely on some of those normal gimmicks because you have abnormal gimmicks that are putting people into the, into the reading. And, and I think that's important because readings are boring. They're boring. Right. 
Like no matter how good the author is or how good the book is, it's boring. Dude, I saw Tom Wolf, white suit and all, yeah. at Barnes and Noble, Union Square in New York City. I was 23. I loved him. Um, I saw, I went I, like 15 minutes in, 10 minutes in. I'm like, eh, what else is going on? Like, you want to get, you know? And this yeah. is like a living legend reading from his, one of his books. And I was like, yeah, yeah. So I had that in mind when Del Rey said, now you go around reading your book. I was like, I remember that Tom Wolf experience. And I'm like, mm, no. Yeah. Sorry, I, I premature Chewbacca, spoiler horn. <laughs> I, I was moving him and it went off. So, well, you had that in mind. Yeah, and that's true. And I learned that experience from, uh, or the first time I went to a screenwriting convention and Harlan Ellison was there. And he mentioned, and he said at one point, he said, by the way, writers, don't ever fucking read from your book straight. He's like, you have to at least, and he, he suggested, he's like, what I do, and this, oh, Harlan Ellison can do this, is after a paragraph, I yell at the audience. I tell them to pay attention, <laughs> you know, to break it up, to get yeah. there, you know. And his basic lesson was you can't just sit and read from a book. You can't. You know? No. And so I thought that was really cool when I, um, you know, first, because I think one of the first times that I looked into you after I read Bird Box, I read about like the really cool readings that you did from it. And I, and, and I thought that was neat. And um, I come from the, you know, I grew, I, 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 in this business, I was, com you know, coming up in the Portland Bizarro scene. And so we had like Carlton Mellick and people like that doing like insane shows instead yeah. of where they just ignore the book. And so I tried, I've always like, my philosophy is you have to read funny parts because that's what keeps people engaged is if they're laughing and they're having a good time. And which is hard for some writers of horror because like we want to scare people, you know, but. But now imagine that you have scary music accompanying you. That changes everything. If you've got like a score, yeah. just like with a movie, if you, um, put on, okay, so I used to fall asleep every night to, I had a VCR in my, a little TV combo thing mm. in my bedroom, and this is not that long ago, and I would play a VHS tape, a horror movie, and let it run all night. It would rewind and start over on its own, and, but I put it on mute, and I would wake up in the middle of the night, and there's Reagan throwing up, and there's, you know, the poltergeist, you know, the thing coming out of the closet and all this. None of that stuff was scary, even at 3.34 in the morning, when you're just waking up alone in a dark room. None of that was scary without the sound. Yeah. And so you add, and then I started thinking about that too. I'm like, this is just a series of like um, makeup images without the sound. And I it started to like strike me. I started thinking of things in those terms too. And that led to, okay, if we ever do a reading, I need, I need a score. I need a live, live music. Or, you know, like I brought, this is my rec record player behind me. Mm -hmm. I brought this one to the last Stoker con. Um, well, different record player, but brought it, um, and, and to be able to play music while while you were reading, while reading it changes everything. Then you can do a scary scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. And so I mean, you can do anything. I mean, you know, I, I just for anybody watching that does read, of course, you can read from your book. But in terms of what I, what I, you and I are talking about right now, in terms of yeah. the, a stage show of it, yeah, yeah, you can lose your audience, and that's one of the lessons that, that that's there. And um, but anyways, uh, so you did. Uh, 14 manuscripts before Bird Box was the one that you sold. What pushed you forward to move from, what made you think this is the one, this is the time this is, uh, that I got to do this? When I met my manager, who I've been with now for 12 years, I think, mm -hmm. his name is Ryan. So let's just call him Ryan for now on, Ryan Lewis. Mm -hmm. When I met Ryan, I think I had written nine novels and the most recent one i had written at the time was unbury carol so i was super thrilled about that one right mm. um and so when he and i started working together it was with his sort of guidance like i think that you know this needs to be more like this or this or that right and we went through it for about a year and a half of me rewriting unbury carol to both of our notes then the moment came where ryan's like i'm going to shop the book to agents and by then I had written, I think, whatever, it doesn't matter. Because Bird Box was written before. So at that point I was like, 
you know, Ryan, I'm a little worried about a Western going first, a little bit, a little worried about a Western. Like, mm. I didn't, I didn't know. In hindsight, it seemed like the, it seems like I made the right decision, but at the time, it just, there was just, <laughs> I sensed something wrong about it or something. I'm like, I, Unmarried Carol is probably my favorite so far of mine, but mm. so what? Like, I understood that a Western first might be difficult. So he was like, oh, we just worked on this for a year and a half. And I was like, well, and then I was like, well, so he's like, which one do you think? And so honestly, I'm not saying this to be funny, but I try to pick sort of the least, um, like the least far out, the least elastic, the least sort of the straightest shot to right. be like, this is a good debut. This is like, uh, like it's a the house, the river, the house, the river, blindfold monster, house, river. Like this seems like a straight shot and it's scary. I thought it was scary. And he was, and so I sent him bird box and he was like, all right, and then for a year and a half, we worked on that one. So I was with Ryan, him and I were essentially rewriting for three years before Ryan shopped Bird Box to who is now my agent, Kristen Nelson, and she shopped it to the publishing houses. So I think it was almost by, with the nine or 10 I had at that time, right? Mm -hmm. Bird Box just felt like the most sort of static, the most black and white, the most like, how do you do? Like, for example, if all the books are a TV series, or episodes of a TV show, and if I'm the host, Bird Box seemed like a good first episode. Mm. It yeah, like and, and, it's a, and it's an incredible introduction to you. <laughs> now that we have like five books of yours out, right? It is an incredible introduction because, um, well, first of all, it shows the, um, the ability that you have for building suspense and doing the scares and doing those things, and then um, and with the subtle character work with Mallory that, that makes it sing. And we'll talk more about that in the spoiler section. But, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a good debut because uh, then you could get more experimental with, with the other books that came. And then we know that you can tell a straightforward horror story to begin with. So right. in that regard, because I agree, because I like Unbury Carol, and I do have questions about Unbury Carol, but... I think it's better as an experiment coming out after, after Bird Box because, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's like the thing of like, you've already won over readers. They're going to, they're going to go with you where, wherever you go at that point. And, um, you know, I like, I like to think of like, you know, how Joe Lansdale always says like, you know, I don't write genre. I am a genre. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And anybody will, who reads Joe Lansdale is going to follow Joe Lansdale because it doesn't matter what he's writing. Yeah. He's still going to be Joe Lansdale. And I think what's good is for us new writers, you got to kind of have to establish, you know, like, hey, I'm worth it. I'm worth it going to, to these things. And, um, you know, Samuel Delaney, the science fiction writer, he recently said, um, what are you doing if you don't think everything you're writing is a masterpiece? <laughs> like, why are you, why are you spending this time? And I think that's valuable advice because, you know, I think, and that's not to say that you didn't realize that I'm Barry Carroll was good. You, you obviously said it's one of your favorites, but you realized it wasn't strategically the one that should go first. Right. But then, you know, it's also like, I'm sure you feel the same way. You, you never want strategy to take over instinct or, or to take over passion or this kind of thing. So I am often, it, it's interesting that we're talking about this actually, um, but I, I am often talking to Ryan about like, like, you know, yes, we should do this, this, but let's not be strategic to a fault because I feel like a reader or a scene can also feel that about someone. Someone you can feel if there's someone in your midst who, who has like the rungs of a ladder in mind or something. And that's not the worst thing to be ambitious and it's not, the worst thing that they have a good plan, but I'm I'm sort of more of like a spirited guy than I am a strategic guy. But but in that particular moment in time, I yeah I was like yeah we need a, we need a straight shot first. Well, you know it's funny because I have a friend that does a a, a podcast devoted to Metallica called Speak and Destroy, and um, I'm not a big Metallica fan as far as I like Through Injustice for All, right? And I'm one of those people that they lost me at the Black Album. But I am fascinated to listen to this podcast because Metallica the machine and the decisions that they make 
as an organization interest me less more so yeah. than the music and that's why that some kind of monster documentary is crazy because they let everybody in behind the curtain when they were almost falling apart and so i do think that the strategy behind what authors do it's a little more inside baseball than not everybody not all the readers are going to enjoy but for me I, I do, and I, do, I specifically think, it, and you're lucky that you have somebody in Ryan that you can run these ideas by because not every writer has somebody they trust right. that well. But, yeah. so can you tell us about Goblin, which was the next, like, wasn't that the next novella you did? You did it as a novella right after Bird Box, or was that after? No, well, it, it went, I actually have them like right here on the shelf in order. Um, Bird Box and then uh, A House at the Bottom of the Lake came out with um, This is Horror, Horror right? And, and Black Mad Wheel with Collins. Goblin is after Black Mad Wheel okay. and that was with Earthling um, uh, uh, what year? 2017 Halloween. So does that come from, is, was that a new idea or did that come from the back catalog? Because you said oh, it's very hard to say in a way, right? Because <sighs> How do I explain it? Like, there's 24 books in the trunk that are not published right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but not because they're bad or worse or whatever. It's just how do you publish 33 at once? There are six years, right? Yeah. So, I mean, they're all back catalog now, right? Right. Uh, no, I don't like, like, uh, the one, I just finished this one. Ta-da! Um, like, two weeks ago. Woo! And, <laughs> thank you. And um, I hope that that one comes out next, but that would be very rare that, I guess Mallory was this way, where the book I wrote was the next book to come out, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So it, I, it's hard for me to look at it like that, but Goblin was, Goblin was the second book I ever wrote. Mm -hmm. And it's six novellas in one, and the rough draft is really amazing in this crate over there. It's handwritten and it's like huge. It's like six novellas and it's just a beast. Um, <laughs> I almost, when I look at the book, I'm like, how did it all fit in there, you know? Right. <laughs> so, funny. Well, and, and I, I, the only one of your novels that I have not read is um, Black Mad Wheel. And the reason I didn't read it is specific because the year before, I wrote a tour horror novel about uh, called Punk Rock Ghost Story. It just came out from Deadite. And because it was like, mine was Haunted Punk Rock Tour Van, so it's different, but like... That's cool. <laughs> um, but because it was a touring book, I just, I, I didn't want to do a review so close to it and sure. I review everything that I read. And, and so I just, I, it kind of, you know, I feel like I'm almost ready now that I can go back because it's been enough years and because I just didn't want anybody to be like, oh, they're working in the, doing the same kind of thing. And, and so I just, I stayed away from it. But, um, but that one must have been very personal because of your experience touring. And I only had the experience of being a merch dude. Um, I've never been a musician, but my book was informed by doing merch on tours for different band for different punk bands. That's cool. And so it's funny because I got all these reviews saying he was clearly on tour with punk bands, and it's like I wasn't in the bands, you know. <laughs> but there's a specific experience of living on the road in the band that is like you kind of have to be there to have to have um, that. So we, we toured for six years, six and a half, where we didn't have apartments, homes, six and a half years, uh, about 250 shows a year. So you got um, road dogs. Ro like full on committed road dogs. Like, like get, we lived off about $10 each a day, meaning enough for like a couple meals. Like, you know, like the band would, um, our drummer, I guess was our CFO. <laughs> And he would like dole out 10 bucks to each of us a day, you know? And, and at night we hoped that the bar would give us food and they always gave us drinks. And that was, I mean, that was how we lived for six years. Dude, six years is high school and a half, man. Yeah. That, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't, wow. It's almost mind boggling to me to consider that now. Cause we didn't start very young. We didn't start at 21. I think we started on the road when I was 26. So it was 26 to like 32 or something. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere in there at about age 29, the other songwriter, Mark, um, left the band. And it was this crazy moment because it's in the middle of all this road and, you know, that's how our lives were. 
Mark left, and because he left, we had to take a couple months off from the road. And in those couple months off, I wrote my first book. Mm. So it was sort of like Mark accidentally or whatever gave me a window where he was like, hey, I'm leaving. And so it was like, you stand still for a minute because <laughs> you have to while we figure out the, how we're going to do with the rest of our lives, right? And I wrote my first book. So then it became writing on the road, whatever. But my point is with Black Man Wheel, I don't really feel like it's like, how do I explain it? I want to write a road band story. Black Man Wheel is different. It's more like a band in like the 50s gets a former soldier, former army band members get sent to like a desert and all this. And, but I want to write one like what you're talking about and, and talk about that arriving at the bar early and, and like all the drinking and sleeping on people's floors and all the crazy unfathomable shit we saw out there. I want to write one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, um, and I have a friend who was in, um, saves the day for a while, the, the indie rock band. And, um, he eventually quit the band because he, his exact words were uh, touring as a time warp. And I had to get out of the warp. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was talking about how like, time was meaningless during those years that he felt like he was stunted. He wasn't growing because it was just like, he was not having a real experience. So it is a really weird thing that I think only the people that have really experienced it um, can talk about. And I, I really just did short stints. So I, I got enough of a picture to be able to write about it, but um, I don't think, I, I think that there's people could call it bullshit on some of it because I didn't, I didn't do the years at a time because that is very oh, different. So what? I want to read that book right now. <laughs> when I was on the road for six years, six and a half years, I, I want to read that book right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's some other cool stuff to it, but I'll tell you after we're done recording. But, um, but yeah, but the, the thing about, um, about the, the touring experience and that, that window where you, you were able to, to write the book is I'm sure you had plenty of nights on the road, late night drives, those things that I'm sure tons of the, tons of the books, especially those late night drives, which are insane. You're trying to keep yourself awake. You're playing weird music. Yeah. Um, there's nothing like waking up in the back of the van and somebody's playing some insane record you've never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, I'm sure a lot of these stories, maybe even Bird Box, came from these like late night drives and experiences. Like, um, yeah, it's crazy what you're saying right now. It's so I hadn't really like thought of it in those terms, really, maybe ever. Because I, Mark and I, Mark, by the way, is back in the band now, but he, mm -hmm. but he did leave back then. And but before then, obviously, we were in a band for a long time together. And he and I both had always been talking. We want to write a novel. We want to write a novel, and we would try. And I had failed at four of them meaning that you know I didn't finish four of them um so it was always this sense of I want to do it and then it wasn't until that first breakthrough like as you know you write one and then you feel like well fuck it I can write a lot of these and yeah. then it started to be while Derek was driving and Chad was in the back sleeping I'm in the passenger seat with like a pillow on my lap and a computer on top of the pillow just like going nuts for I must have written Ooh, six, seven books, like, in the van, like, driving between cities. But think about it. That's a great time to do it. Like, I, I, I can totally get it. Put right. on the phones, just jam out, like. I know, and then when I, when I tell people that, a lot of the time they're like, you rode in the, on the road. It's like, you don't understand. You literally have three so hours dead time. average of just so much dead time. Yeah. And I could have been reading the whole time. I could have been, this was, oh, this was interesting. That era is before... I didn't have a smartphone until I was like 32 or something. Right. The thing about that too, like, or even 33. So like I was years away from having something where that I could have, I'd like, I couldn't search online and shit. I didn't even have a cell phone until I was 30. So we had already been on the road for four years then. Mm -hmm. So get rid of that. Now what do you, what do you got in the bus with you? You got a book or you talk to your bandmate or you write a book. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends who are in bands that, did a lot of writing on the road, um, some of which they were using. I have a friend who was in a band who he eventually, he's not doing music now, but he has a career doing rock journalism and he does band management now, but he did a lot of the writing of the articles, like, well, sitting in the van, you know, like going from one city to the other and, 
And while, like, the rest of the guys in the band were, like, just sleeping or doing whatever, he's, like, pecking away, like, you know. So it's a smart way to make use of the time. Now, on Barry Carroll, um, like, the whole supernatural Western thing, like, th that's something that has been done before. That is a subgenre of Western. In fact, um, Richard Matheson uh, wrote Shadow on the Sun, which is a great horror Western. So there is a tradition of this. Um, so I was excited when Barry Carroll came out, but it was, um, and, and you've already kind of talked about this, it wasn't the most um, immediate, like, it's not the most conventional, like, commercial turn that you could have taken. Um, but my favorite thing in the book was um, the idea, the setting of the trail. Was that what started the, the story, or, or was the Carroll kind of horror Sleeping Beauty thing, what, what started it? Well, I've always felt weird that that um, it was billed as anything about Sleeping Beauty, because that's like the last, like, I didn't even think about that at all. And I don't even, like, there isn't any really Sleeping Beauty element, except that she's under, you know? Like, mm -hmm. she, it's, I mean, she's just in a coma. But, like, I, I saw that it was, like, pitched and billed that way, and I'm like, ah, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't do that. But, but yeah. to me, uh, hey, that happens. It's happened to me, too. But I know, I know, but I, I also was like, I'm not going to say anything, whatever. I mean, who cares, right? <laughs> but... It started in the strangest of places, which is um, with smoke. I um, was in a, a grocery store, and I had one of those um, grill lighters on me, the long ones. And I had cowboy boots, and this girl I was dating at the time was in some other aisle. And I was just walking down the aisle alone, like on my uh, heels of the boots, just bored out of my mind. I'm walking on the heels of my boots, you know? You know I don't know if you ever wear cowboy boots, but I almost always do. And you get to kind of like walk like like this on the heels of them, like like almost like balancing. And then I was pretending that like I was like spilling oil behind me through my boots or whatever. And I would take the lighter and like boom, and imagine the aisle going up in flames and switch hands like boom, and that and the aisle going up in flames. I'm like this guy's this is kind of a badass character that I'm thinking of right now. This guy who has like oil in his legs, like maybe he's got like tin stiff legs, so he's limping around and he can like just you know, destruct, whatever. It, so it all started with him. I was like, I need a story around this guy. And as you know from reading the book, that he becomes almost like, a, not peripheral, but a much smaller part of it than, than that, because it's not like it's his story at all. Mm -hmm. But it definitely started with him and led to, through who knows how, to where it ended up. Carol's my favorite, one of them. Because remember, there's a bunch that are unpublished as well, so we'll see, but... Carol's one of my favorites because of how elastic it is, of how, like, it's just, it's, it's probably the least, I don't know if horror is the right word, it's the least scary. It's the most playful to me. It's the most imaginative. It's the most elastic. And, I, like, I, I look for those things in other books. I look for those things in movies. This sort of, like, almost, like, um, bet tweener, between genre, but with confidence, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so Carol to me has always felt, it almost feels like it was done like vignettes, like every chapter is a, a character name almost. Mm. And, but no, there's no two scenes in the book that have the same character configuration in them. In the right. entire it, which is something you couldn't play with in, for example, Inspection or Bird Box right. because they're very tight concepts that have to follow right. what they're doing. And, and so on Barry Carroll is one where you could Kind of fart around with those things and and do all that and um which is cool like and i definitely like that just for me personally the thing that i thought was neatest was this idea of this kind of i don't want to say haunted trail um but like the way that the trail kind of invokes fear in people and and and, and so that that was that was the one that was the part of unbury carol that most hooked me um but i oh. did i did like the variety that you got from from beginning to end and and um and well it's not my favorite of your books um i enjoyed it quite a bit and um it, and um what's funny is is that that's when you know you're really connecting to an author i think as a reader is when you can be like eh that wasn't my favorite but i really had fun reading it <laughs> i really yeah i know it. what you mean i really do know what you mean because it's like uh, with all of our, I don't want to say our favorites, but yeah, okay, I'll say that for now. With all of our favorites or whatever, like, let's say Richard Lehman, right? Where, like, I'll read one, I'm like, oh, God, this one, it's just this and that. 
but I, like I still liked it. Like, and I still want to read the next one. And I have had enough good experiences with him that I just innately trust him or something. Yeah, and that's the that's thing. That experience, yeah. Yeah, and and I think um, for me, on Barry Carroll was uh, was was the moment where Josh Mellerman became an author that I trusted, in that sense, because I was like, it wasn't my favorite, but I had a really good time, and I really enjoyed seeing you play with the Western tropes and the Western like kind of environment, and. Um, you know, so for me, that that was kind of informative for that. Now, inspection um, was cool because I think there's this, there's kind of, I know it wasn't intentional, but uh, there's this, there's been these kinds of mystery dystopias that a lot of really great authors have touched on um, that are similar to inspection with, and I'm thinking of Sarah Pembroke's Death House or uh, M.R. Carey's The Girl with the Gifts. And I was very excited because Inspection really felt like it fit in with those books that I, I really love both those books. So, um, and what I really liked about Inspection was the book is a dystopia mystery kind of thing. And you, it, you maintained the mystery of what's happening in the world. You didn't like go into it. I still don't know <laughs> what's happening outside of the confines of the small part of the story. And I think that that was so essential to what made that book creepy and work for me is because even if the kids who, um, and it's been a little while since I've read Inspection, but they had the numbers, right? They go, but the letters, yeah. Letters, yeah. It, and the characters, if they escape, right? Like the whole time I kept thinking to myself, well, escape is not, I have no idea what escape means. <laughs> yeah. I know, that was really important to the book for me in the reading process because I, I couldn't root for them to escape. I couldn't root for them to get out. So um, tell me a little bit about where Inspection came from. Was that one of the books from the, from the back or is that a new one, a new idea? I mean, again, it was, it was I guess it's from the back, but it's, it's hard to say like because Inspection came out in 19, right? Yeah. And it was written, okay, it was, it was this, it's, I think it's the seventh one I wrote. So that one that was written before I met Ryan as well. Carol, Goblin, Burbas, and Inspection were, but not the other ones. Um, so Inspection, though, was, I, it really started with the idea of um, a character or the idea that you might be distracted from um, your full potential because you're so, like, caught up in, like, trying to make out, trying to have sex, trying the, the, whatever you're into, right? You're trying to, trying to um, court someone. That love and sex could like distract like the opposite sex, uh, could distract uh, you, me, any thinker from like this ultimate potential. And it's a really cold thought to have because obviously those things inspire your, your real potential, right? I mean like love and, and flirting and and courting and talking and wanting and desiring. I mean, these things all inspire and inform what kind of thinker and whether it's an engineer or an artist, right? Mm -hmm. But for Richard, who felt that he, um, you know, had squandered his own potential, he blamed it on that. So for him, it was, this isn't my fault. This is the fault of like my libido. This is the fault of, you know, the human nature and I can change that. So that was exciting to me to have this megalomani megalomaniac um, that was like, I can create what I should have been out of these boys. And that, that was a, like, that was like, that had a certain, certain uh, mad scientist feel to me that I loved. And so it started with him and then the boys. And then it all, I, I, I don't know if this is a spoiler. I don't know if it matters because it's on the back of the book. But obviously the book's no fun if they don't meet girls, right? There's, it, right? What kind of book would this be without that? And the whole book led up to that moment. And there, and there wasn't much after that at the time. And I was about a week away from finishing the, the rewrite. And you know how long these, these moments take. And Allison said to me, hey, I think you should tell the whole girl story. I think when, that, when, the boys, when the boy meets up with the girl, I think you should then tell their whole story. And then back to meeting up again. And I was like, 
Allison, that's like a 150 page idea, man. I'm not gonna, I can't do that, you know? And then I went outside to walk the dog and I thought about what Allison said and I was like, oh shit, that's a good, I gotta do that idea. Came back in, called Del Rey, called my manager, called, I was like, I think I'm gonna add, like, I was a week away from being done, like Del Rey's hands done. And I was like, yeah. I think I'm gonna add 150 pages to this tell the girl story. And they were like, yes. Everyone was like, yes, do it, do it. So Allison played a major, Allison is my fiance, played a major role in how inspection was uh, shake, shook out. And that was great and important advice because um, I think what goes on in inspection is, is that you're getting, if you're gonna see the mad scientists try to engineer boys to be this way, you kind of also have to see the difference in how, how the girls are engineered. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and when they come together, you know, it, it's just, you know, it, it made it a more powerful book. And sometimes like when somebody tells you, you, you got to do this. Um, I had that in one of my books where, um, an editor told me to lose the entire first, like four chapters. And at first I was just like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm telling you, it starts chapter four. It's really going to work. And then I had to just be like, all right, I got to, I got to explore this. If somebody's telling me this and now I'm really happy that the book starts where it does, but sometimes you just have to like, it sounds really painful to make these changes, but yeah, you know, that's one of the reasons why you have editors is you have somebody to, to look at something objectively from the outside. I'm, I'm, and maybe it sounds like you are too, but I'm ultimately, I'm open to all that kind of stuff. You know, there yeah. can be a moment of sort of pride where you're like, look, I, I, I don't know. But it doesn't last long for me. I, I'm like, I, I think about like, okay, is that a good idea? Is that better? Like, you know what I think, man? I think it has to do with like being in a band. Like I write the songs, but I don't tell them what to play, right? I would never do that. These are my best friends and they're brilliant mus musicians when I tell them what to do. So I see it like I write the song, the rough draft of inspection. And then if Allison or Ryan or Kristen or someone has like an idea that flies, let's, let's use it, you know? So I, I'm pretty open to that stuff, are you? Yeah, I am. I just, I think you, sometimes you have to know when your story, when somebody's like missing the aspect of your story. So sometimes yeah. you do have to stand up for it. Mm -hmm. Not that every time it's right. Um, and I've definitely had times where I've had to put my foot down for a story. But, um, but I also believe even when they don't, when those ideas don't work, you have to, um, you still have to listen and you have to kind of explore. And that's one of the cool things about, and I know today, he just, today on Facebook, we're talking about how much you love rough drafts. Yeah. And um, <laughs> me personally, like my favorite era in the life of a book is when you've let the first draft sit for a couple months and you come back to it and you're reading it with fresh eyes and tweaking. Oh it's yeah. My, that is I love that part of, of the book. And <laughs> so I could live and that, and the funny thing is I like first drafts and I like writing that part, but that part is really exhausting and tiring. And sometimes people don't understand when you say like, when you get done writing a first draft day, how you're exhausted and you just want to lay down sometimes. Yeah. I don't ever feel that way when I'm tweaking on the second draft. Cause I'm just, I'm having yeah. fun. Right. I'm just, you know, you know, as a songwriter, when you're, you know, it's a little easier when you're writing songs because you're just playing around with the ideas of music and, you know, put this here and put this there. And, you know, a, a document that's 80,000 to 100,000 words is a totally different beat than writing a song. But it's yeah. that collaborative process and that is fun. Okay, so now you're serializing a novel, Carpenter's Farm, on your, on your website. Now, I admit... I haven't read it because I, I'm definitely a physical book guy and I have told myself that I'm waiting for you to collect it and I'm hoping one day that will happen. I'm assuming that it will. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, how did that come about? And um, I mean, with a title like Carpenter's Farm, like, is it a tribute to John Carpenter? Because <laughs> yeah, so definitely my favorite filmmaker from my childhood, but. So I had planned on, I, I tried to write Carpenter's Farm years ago. I, I made it like 40K deep and it was just, everything about it was wrong. Like the whole, the characters, the approach, but the root idea of it was, is, I knew it was great, but I just did it totally wrong. You ever 
just do one wrong. Yeah. 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 So I don't know where in February this year, I was like, oh, I got it. I got Carpenter's Farm now. I'm going to write it in April. Then the lockdown happened. Mm. And I'm like, oh, shit. Well, I'm still going to write this in April. But my webmaster, because of the lockdown, asked me if I had a different short story to go up for free on the site instead of the one that had been up there for three years, right? Yeah. So I was like, I don't have a short story. He's like, do you want to write a new one? I'm like, no. But I do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this novel. You want to just put this novel up there, you know, serialize it? And he was like, yeah. So he came, we had all these oh, talks, yeah. and blah, 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 and everything. Was, and then I also started thinking, we're on lockdown. If somebody's strapped for cash, here's a book for free. Here's, um, you know, we're all together in this. And also, it's kind of like something exciting to look forward to, um, serialize that isn't TV, right? Mm-hmm. So all these factors put together, I was like, oh, shit, I'm about to write a book live. Because I wrote it, checked it, posted it. And every, like, two days or something like that. It's done now. That whole novel's done and up there. Oh. So, so that was the gestation was just I was going to write it anyway. And then I realized that people are, like, strapped for money. I have a book coming out, Mallory, as you know. It was coming out later in July, which now it's out. So to me, it was like, what I, why not just, let's just do this for people and for myself. Let's do this. So the yeah. thing that was crazy about that one, though, dude, <laughs> is as you know... <laughs> Sometimes you can write yourself into a corner. And I think it would have been because of how crazy it was what I was doing. I, I don't think anyone would have faulted me for erasing a chapter and starting, you know, and fixing stuff, you know, as I went or something. But I didn't want to have to do that. I wanted to make it all yeah, the way. locked in. Yeah. yeah. And, and I did. I made it. There was one time where I was like, oh, shit. But I kind of like veered around it and, and made it to the end. And even if it is ever collected, like you said, and put out in the hardcover or a hard copy at all, I would, um, I don't know if I would change it because you know what it is to me now? It's like a live album. It's like, Mm -hmm. and I know live albums get fixed too, double track of voice and shit like that. But, but I don't know. It was like the spirit of the thing was you're at home. I'm at home. Let's roll. I'm going to do this in front of you and and with you and a bunch of other people, you know, added music, added drawings, added other stories. So it would almost feel like, like anti the project itself to go and, and rewrite it. So if Carpenter's Farm ever does come out, I think it would be exactly what's on the website now. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, it sounded really neat. I'm just, I'm just a physical book guy. So like that was, and, and I kept telling myself, I, 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 I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for if it becomes a book, but now you're making me feel like really sad that I didn't take part in the unrolling of it. Oh, it was uh, so fun, man. It was so fun. Yeah, I, I bet. Um, so, without spoilers yet, let's let's do a non-spoiler like introduction to Mallory. Um, you have said in the past that there was a longer version of Bird Box that you took parts out of. Did um, was Mallory? Con- did it consist of the parts that you pulled out of it, or is it something entirely new? So it's totally insane and you're going to relate to this as a writer. Bird Box was twice as long and it had a thread that I removed because I felt like it just kind of got in the, got in the way, got in the way of the tension or something. Mm-hmm. And, but through the years, I'm like, am I ever going to tell that thread, that story? So eventually when I did sit down and write Mallory, yes, that was the thread. But guess what? By the end of it, I got rid of it again. <laughs> <laughs> that so, thread didn't even come up in, no. No. So there's, that's twice. And that's such a weird thing. I don't know if you've ever had this. There were two, I know it's the same world, but two separate books that this thread played a major role in that you ended up stripping out of both. And now it's not, not in both, and both books are out in the world. That is, like, super interesting to me. Yeah. Well, you know, it's weird because um, I'm a religious outliner. I don't know if you're a pantser or an outliner, but I'm an outliner, and I'm religious about it. But... One of the things that I, I get really annoyed when, when people who are anti-outlining will say that it's soulless or that, you know, because I've heard that. And, and, and so I'm less likely to write myself into a corner where I don't know what's, what's coming. Right. You know, I'm less likely to do that in my process. But to me, an outline is a living document. And I just finished a book that 
is 138,000 words. It's my longest, it's my longest novel I've written yet. And I have maybe seven drafts of the outline. <laughs> like the outline changed yeah. as I was writing it and I'd go back and I'd have different versions of the outline because once the novel was alive, to me, an outline is like looking at a map of the city. That doesn't mean you've experienced the city by looking at the map. And so when you go into an outline and, and you go into it, yes, there are threads that I, I picked away and decided, no, not doing that, or now I got to do this. And what happened in my novel, which was very specific to writing it in the pandemic, is that the novel became very much about partisan politics in a way that I didn't plan, but living through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure now, and we're going to talk about this when we get to Mallory, because Mallory looks like a totally different book. Yeah, I know. Post, post the pandemic um, than you probably ever intended it to be. So that's one of the reasons why I really connected to Mallory, because I was like, hey, I had the same experience writing this book. <laughs> and, um, and it's one that's far from, from being done. I, I've got a long way to go on it. That first draft is done, but but I did experience that. But I, so I understand what you're talking about of, of like the things you plan to do, you ended up not doing. And I do think that that's really interesting. But, and specifically now with the success of Bird Box, there's going to be people that are going to say, are going to think that like, oh, well, he just wrote a sequel to Bird Box because Bird Box was this big success. But I had the opposite viewpoint when I heard, when you announced you were doing Mallory, I was like, oh shit, that's a lot of pressure <laughs> because of the success. Yeah. And, and you know, it's like the non-writers had the reaction of, oh, is he cashing in? And the writers were like, oh shit, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to put on yeah. Um, you know, it was kind of threefold why. Number one was um, that thread. And through the years, my my agent telling me or asking me, would you ever write a sequel, this kind of thing. Then the second thing was seeing Sandra Bullock as Mallory. It was like mind-blowing. One of the greatest actresses, like really, of our generation. Like seeing her as Mallory was like, what is going on right now? Like I had heard she was playing it, but to actually see it was like another story. And then... And then it probably bubbled up ideas in your head like yes. and then also the how well the movie did yeah sure that's a part of it too so those three factors together having an idea seeing sandra bullock and like what that did was like crazy to me and then how well it did so all of those added together of okay i'll do it right now let's do it right now yeah and um not, not, not only being a success but being a meme and having people like crazy Wearing blindfolds as a challenge, like... It was totally crazy, man, because I'm, you know, 45. I mean, this happened, and that movie only came out like a year and a half ago, you know? And, and like, I'm like, so it's not like I was 21 or something. I've lived like a whole artistic life or half of one, whatever. And so for that to happen, I wasn't like, there wasn't one second that I wasn't grateful for. Like, not one. I mean it. Yeah. Like, it wasn't like, oh, yes, uh, it's about time my shit came in. No, it was more like what the fuck is going on? This is yeah, amazing. Yeah. And in terms of the pressure, I was like, um, I was able to, I wonder if you've ever done this, like almost like a double think of like, um, hey man, oh, like this better be good. Like this has to be good. And if it's not, it's just a book. This better be good. Eh, who cares if it is? This better be good. Don't worry about it. But able to maintain both of those throughout the whole process. And what that did for me was that made me, I didn't, I didn't really feel that much pressure, dude. I didn't. Before sitting down to write, I had a moment of like, uh-oh, this is going to be, this is heavy. And then the minute I started, I was like, no, this is fun. We got her in the school for the blind. And shit's going crazy. Come on, let's roll. It was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. I felt more pressure when the book came out, like a, a month ago, a month and a half ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, then I was like, oh, God, I hope it does well for Del Rey. But in terms of writing it, I really did not feel that much pressure on once I started. But like you said before, it was there was like a, a wind tunnel wave of it. <laughs> well, there's that Samuel Delaney thing of like, you should never write anything if you don't think it's a masterpiece. Yeah. You, you need to commit to it and you have to believe in, yeah. in the story. And I think um, 
just a specific way that I do things, like uh, I can add pressure to myself on things where um, uh, the way I, I've, I've only once written a book right after thinking of it. Um, most of my ideas gestate for years. Um, I'm a believer in letting ideas gestate and then like, okay, now's the time. I wrote a end of the world climate change novel called Ring of Fire and I researched that book for almost 15 years before I wrote it. And, ah. um, and, you know, for me, it was the decision of like, when am I gonna, gonna write this? You know, like, I have to like, think about these things. The only one that I ever wrote like that was, um, when I got my deal with Deadeye, my five book deal with Deadeye, it was basically because Carlton Bellick said to me, vegan books sell, zombie books sell, you're a vegan horror writer, write me a vegan zombie book. And at first I was like, I told him, well, that's a really stupid idea. I don't, I don't really want to do that. And he was like, well, we'll give you five books if you write it. And then I'm like, all right, give me two weeks. To get an idea. <laughs> and then that's the only time that I've ever, you know, the vegan revolution with zombies was that book. And that's my only satire, pulling satire. And I think because it was a funny book, I could just like get into it. But for me, like having to think about these ideas and what's really cool to learn about your process is is hearing about how yeah i think you're similar in a lot of ways as these ideas just take for years for you and I think, so on a personal basis because i i've had this experience so i'm wondering that's got to for me the coolest thing in letting these ideas just ate is that when you finally get to write a scene that you've thought about for 10 years that's a fuck yeah moment like yeah, yeah i've been writing this part yep Absolutely, yes. That that happened both with Mallory and Carpenter's Farm, where it was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm finally fucking doing this. And and you and I are both the kind of guys, it's not like we haven't done anything else in the meantime, and we're always yeah. doing it. But still, when that moment comes around, you're like, oh, I like, it's almost like, it's almost like Carpenter's Farm was in the room with me for three, four, five years or something. Yeah. And then, like even you know oh if somebody would say like do you have you written all your ideas or what ideas do you have that it was always lurking and now it's now it's out now it's done and it's like what a fucking feeling that is yeah and sometimes you can have a a, a scene that you've been that especially as a scene a twist or a terrible part or something terrible that happens to a character that you love and if you've been thinking about it for 10 years it can be super emotional to write that part yeah after. yeah and yeah. The time. yeah i had a character that dies in Ring of Fire and that when I wrote that scene it was like I, I like had to like really pump myself up to sit down and write that chapter like I, I looked at the outline knew it was coming and that morning I was just like fuck here we go here we go <laughs> and I'm sure you had a lot of those moments um okay so now we're gonna we're gonna do the spoilers so everybody Chewbacca we're in spoilers all right. <laughs> I love that that's now we're in spoilers. Now we're in spoilers. We're going to assume that anybody listening to this point has already gotten Mallory and read it and um, Bird Box 2, um, obviously. <laughs> and for starters, I liked the movie, but as a fan of the book, and I will tell you, and this comes down to specifically, and I've written about this in my book review, and I mentioned it even in my Mallory review, is that um, for me, one of the things that worked best about Bird Box was I bought it because I saw people in line with it <laughs> to get it signed at World Horror. I went into a totally cold. I had no idea what the plot was, nothing. So for me, the first 70 pages of Bird Box was a completely different experience because the first 70 pages, if you don't know what the plot is, you're, you don't know that these monsters are real. So you spend the first 70 pages thinking, this woman is crazy. She's mm -hmm. abusive. She, mm -hmm. She's totally fucking over these kids. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, the few things that I was really bummed about with the movie is that the, you're confirmed that the monsters are real very quickly because you have to see the events happening in the movie. And so it... it it's not the filmmaker's fault necessarily, but there's a paranoia and a question of reality that happens in the first 70 pages, especially as a Philip K. guy, that 
you know, I really loved in Bird Box. Was that intentional or something that kind of happened accidentally as you as you started writing it? Well, I started I started thinking about the same exact thing that you're describing now. Um, I realized how prevalent this was when I saw the movie. Why? Because or or, or when I read the script for the movie, mm-hmm. because um, the whole like car crash and all that leading to running into the house yeah. is very different than Mallory being with her sister in a house, hearing about this, her sister offering herself, then Mallory reading the address of a place that needs, or says, come here, and it's like a think tank house, and Mallory taking that drive, that paranoid drive to that house alone. Because that paranoid drive to that house, to me, sets up the whole novel. It's exactly what you're saying. She yeah. like, oh, drives, she closes them. She runs something over. She looks to the right. She looks left. She doesn't even know if it's okay to look or not. And in that whole drive, you don't know how how real or whatever this shit is. So and then the cross cutting with the river, and that she's already convinced at that point. Yeah, but we're not convinced as a reader. We're right. not convinced, and um, so it is a, an inherent difference between the film and the book. But again, yeah. it says a lot. And this is and for spoilers. And once we do spoilers, I this is about I learned a lot reading your your two horror novels that we're talking about here today that I can use for my writing and I want other writers to pay attention to you know the mechanics and the nuts and bolts that are behind everything and I think what was so crucial in those first 70 pages was that idea that we don't know if the monsters are real and how you don't have to show the monsters and you don't have to show the freak out to build the paranoia. And that's actually more powerful way to start the story because that's how you're building it. And, 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 that, and that's a behind the, that's a nuts and bolts of, of how Bird Box works, right? Yeah, 100%, it, yeah. yeah. Um, but then, like for example, in the movie, how like their eyes change. Well, yeah. that means we saw something. They were now we know that it's, that's real because um, it's a visual medium, and they have to show. Right? No, well, but you could have done you you could have done like that drive to that house alone, and just a paranoid, freaked out with Trent Reznor music playing. You know, like build <laughs> up like is something out here or not? Like her sister off herself, so think that should be enough, isn't it? Or no, maybe her sister like uh, bought into all this, like you know. So, but uh, again, like. Dude, I'm, fi- I'm beyond grateful about the movie, and I love it. I'm not even worried about that. Yeah. But I do think that, that the book is scarier for that reason. I think the book is scarier than the movie, almost for exclusively what you're talking about right now, and the birth scene in the book as well. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a real centerpiece moment where in the movie, it's kind of like it just happens somewhat quickly. Um, but those two elements, to me, are what make it... Uh, more of a horror story than than the movie was. The movie seems more like more like a strange adventure. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and that's what you were talking about with Unbury Carol that people um, mischaracterize uh, this horror novel that I wrote, the Ring of Fire, the Cli-Fi one. I had a lot of people comparing it to um, San Andreas, which I which blew my mind because I was like, it's not an action disaster story. But then I was like, well, you know, if people get that out of it, <laughs> you know, what can I yeah. say? What can I yeah. say? You know, they're, they're, they're getting that. And that sometimes happens. So, um, so I'm going to mostly focus on Mallory because I just read it okay. <laughs> like a week ago. And um, I think one of the really important things that you did early on in Mallory, similar to that, paranoia that happens because here's the thing as a as a writing exercise this is a different animal because you've already established the first book and you would be crazy not to deal with the fact that a lot of the people are coming to this book because they re- they saw the movie so you you have to factor that in as a writer when you're composing this this story so how do you get that paranoia and that feeling again in the beginning of a story that has such well-established rules, the blindfold, and everybody doing the bird box challenge. How do you play with that? Well, at the school of the blind where the story starts, you have the person who loses their mind and 
we don't know if the and it starts the whole paranoia because Mallory is now convinced that the blindfold is not enough. That they could possibly touch you. Yeah. And um I'm sorry. A little bit of dog fight back there. <laughs> I have two dog, you have two, I have two. Yeah, I yeah. have three behind there and two there. Um but so that fear that the touch could it was an important change and I think equals the paranoia of the first part because it changes everything for Mallory. So how yeah. important was that fear of the potential touch? So when my lawyer, um, Wayne, read Bird Box, he said to me, he loved it, but he said to me at the end, he's like, I have one problem. If, if it's a matter of um, experiencing infinity that we can't fathom, right? And that's what drives you crazy. What about when the creature in Bird Box pulls the blindfold from her face? Wouldn't she touch it? And wouldn't touching it be experiencing it? And wouldn't hearing it be experiencing it? So why is it just seeing? And, and I was like, Wayne, let, let's just leave it to seeing, you know? But then that idea, his question like stuck with me for a while, you know? Where I was like, where I was like, man, well, first of all, in Bird Box, because we're in the spoiler thing, I feel free to say this. I, um, the, when that moment when the, when she's about to look and then the blindfold is pulled from her face, um, I've always imagined that that was Gary that did that, that he was following her down the river. And if that, I always imagined like an aerial shot of her in the water, like, and Gary maybe shirtless and sweaty and like pulling the fold, like almost wanting her to look and be like, I'm still here, you know, but she doesn't look and he puts it back or whatever. And so I don't have a concrete moment in Bird Box where Mallory was touched by one, if I say that that was Gary. So that opened a door for me. I've always thought that that was Gary or always considered that it was Gary. So that opened the door for me on this one where it was like, hmm, well, how can we establish that it might be touched? Well, if a blind woman goes mad, right. now we have a problem. Now we have a serious problem in this world. And that's sort of to me the beauty of the Bird Box world is that's a very, very small um, escalation. Now a blind woman goes mad. And just one little sentence I just gave you, and now the whole book, the whole scenario just escalated. Right, and, and since we're in spoilers, and uh, you know, because what I thought in that moment was, yeah, I had the moment when that happened, I was like, oh shit, okay, here we go. Here's what starts book two, right? And then um, I was wondering, in that moment, I did think to myself, well, if a blind woman, you know, there's varying degrees of blindness, right? Like there's some people that are totally blind. There's some people who are just, and if you could, and if there's some people who just see lights or colors or, you know, those kinds of things. And if that's all it takes, if somebody is 90% blind, if that 10% is enough. So I started thinking about these things and I, I had fun thinking about like, but what I, I liked was is that you don't really explain. She doesn't know. Mallory doesn't know. She just knows that I no longer feel safe at this school, the blind. Right. And then it leads to her like wanting them to all well, wear ho to wear hoodies. And I and I'd like to see how they do the backwards hoodies in a movie with not making it look silly. So that's something that I think is is uh cool because it's stick it's something that can work in a novel, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh so, so there were all those aspects, uh, but what I liked about that was is that it brought back the paranoia and it was, and like you said, it was that triggering event that sets off the novel into, you know, and gives us a reason to have a sequel where, where that's, um, hold on, I, I'm gonna, so that's kind of what drives book two to, into a new direction. Now, also important for what you had to do in book two that was different from the first book is that you had to develop Tom and Olympia as teenagers, you know, not just like kids who run around screaming and follow, follow Mallory, like <laughs> they have to be real characters now, like to a full degree. Um, not that they weren't important to the story before, but it's different writing teenagers. It's very different writing teenagers, you know? Yeah, I almost feel like there's, there's one sort of, um, like ghostly thing here, right? Is that if Tom the boy is like Tom the man was, and he is a lot like him, 
But he's never met Tom the Man, because Tom the Man was killed the night that Tom the Boy was born. Mm -hmm. Implies that Mallory raised Tom the Boy with a lot of Tom the Man's ideals or thinking yeah. or worldview. And here, there's almost like a ghostly thing there that she claims to be so one way, but then in Bird Box, she's completely not enamored with Tom, but she trusts him. She's rooting for him. She wants him his optimism to pull through. And then here she has a son years later who's grown up to be a lot like that guy. And I can't help but think, Mallory, I think you might have raised your boy more to be like what he is than you realize. Right. Because you're the only one that raised him, and he's acting a lot like a guy that you 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 revered at near the end of that dude's life. And so I can't help but feel like there's there's a ghostly element there that, that kind of goes unspoken. And Olympia is just purely her own thing, I think. Just like yeah. purely, it's obvious to me that she's from a different mother and, you know, parents all together. It's obvious to me that she's keeping a secret the whole time. It's obvious to me that Olympia travels sort of in a, she's a bit, I don't want to say detached because she's not cold, but she's having her own experience outside of what Tom and Mallory are to me. And that though is very teenager. And, and yeah. I didn't, you know, that I didn't really plan on that, but Olympia, as she started to unfold, I was like, oh, you're a, you're like a really smart teenager, but you're still a teenager. Yeah. And they're yeah. both different kinds of teenagers and, 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 uh, you know, Tom is pushing against the rules and kind of rebellious. And, and that's where uh, Mallory becomes a weird 2020 release <laughs> because Tom is kind of, you know, and, and I wrote about this extensively in my review, but the, the thing that made Mallory a really interesting book to read in the pandemic, and it's funny because I've read a couple books during this pandemic that, um, took on totally different meanings because of the time that you're reading them. I read um, Naked Sun by Isaac Asimov, which is a book about social distancing, a planet where people don't interact, right? Okay. Yeah, and um, it's a murder mystery where nobody can be in the same room because the whole planet, they're all- That sounds you know, amazing. Yeah, um, and then I read um, China Mountain Zhang, um, which won like all the sci-fi awards in the mid 90s. And that book is about economic collapse and how China basically becomes the dominant culture on the planet because America's economy just collapses. And it was like, I read that book as like all the jobs were free falling and like, and, and so I almost was just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, reading that. And so, and the third book that I had a really intense pandemic experience with was Mallory because as I was reading it is at the height of all the, you know, people refusing to wear masks and the debate over masks. And um, in your state, um, gunmen went to the state capitol, like mad that they were being told to socially distance and do all this stuff during a pandemic, which is ridiculous. And so speaking for all those people is this character, Tom, who thinks the rules that his mother has put on him his whole life are ridiculous. He, he's not sure if she's crazy. And, and he thinks he can invent a device that can get around this. And so his desire in the first half of the book to not wear the mask and to push the boundaries got really spoke to, to the moment in a way that you obviously were not thinking of when you wrote it how crazy is it to see that happen kind of similar to the uh bird box challenge that happened online that had to be weird it, this is one of the most surreal things though is what you're describing right now the whole mask you know the non-mask the mask debate and argument and to see mallory's like so hardcore mask that the irony in, in a weird way is that mallory almost seems more of the conservative though Right. And Tom seems the more progressive, right? But right. those roles are reversed in terms of, you know, um, what we're experiencing, or at least what we label ourselves or call ourselves, right? Yeah. Whereas the progressive is saying, wear the freaking mask. And the conservative, I guess if that word exists anymore, the conservative yeah. is saying, um, screw you, I don't want it. 
But Tom, the boy, obviously Tom is the only Tom in Mallory. Tom is, um, what's the right phrase? He's not just saying no for freedom's sake. He's saying, no, we could do better than this. Right. So if the Republican Party or conservatives or whatever were like, hey, fuck those masks. We have better masks for you. And here's a different way you could, you know, a breathing apparatus or some sort of face shield or whatever. If they were like, screw those silly masks, let's do this. That would be Tom and Mallory, where Mallory would be like, no, we know like a surgeon, dude, the mask is, protects you from germs. Like, that's all we need. And um, a conservative neighbor would be like, instead of being like, fuck your rules, they would be like, hey, hey, look at this shield that every time somebody said there's a sensor and whenever somebody comes within six feet of you, it goes down. Like, that would be interesting and exciting. And we could discuss that. Instead, obviously, you know the reality of what we're in. So Tom the boy, I keep saying that, but I've been calling him that for years. Tom the boy is um, closer to you and me than, than this conversation lets on. Because it sounds like he's just saying, like, screw you. You can't get in my way, mom. But no, he actually wants to do good with this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and it's not to say that it's one for one, you know. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. Masturbate, but it's just, it's really fascinating when you're reading the book and he has such a strong desire and then you have Mallory who's like, you've got to wear the fucking blindfold. Yeah. It's going to save your fucking life. Do it. Yeah. It's just, it's funny because you just, you know, when you see like the footage of the, all the people like partying in the lake for the holidays and, 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 and you just, you feel like, <laughs> you feel like Mallory in those moments saying, just wear the freaking mask. Like, yeah. Did you, did you see that article that came out with, um, what's Dave Agger's thing? Uh, what's that called? Uh, McSweeney's. Mm. McSweeney's put out like an article. It's written from Mallory's perspective. No, no. I think the mom in Bird Box has a thing or two to say about wearing a mask. <laughs> and it's this brilliant article. It's like, wear the fucking mask. Like, it's, it's like, it's so good. And I wrote the author, this woman on Twitter. I wrote her. I'm like, that was amazing. Thank you. Like, they didn't, of course, they didn't need to okay or anything. They, they, yeah. I thought like anybody else did online. Yeah. And I was like, that was freaking amazing. But Is she yeah. wrote the sequel yet? Or or did she just go from bird box? I think it came out that article came out before then. Oh okay. Because it came out like um in uh May or June. I think May. Yeah, of, so just, uh, you must have been like, what wait till you read the sequel. Yeah, I know. I like yeah. now I'm right. But but the here's a weird thing too, and sometimes I can get sort of like um emotional when I talk about Mallory, um, is that I'm like proud, or I'm glad, like proud that she's like that. That like, it, obviously I didn't know any of this shit was coming, but like I'm like, oh, but it's cool that she and landed on like our side of this yeah. ridiculous debate. I'm I'm proud that she landed on this side of that or something. It's cool. Yeah, and and you know we've had these moments where. You know, look, it took me a while. I mean, there's certain things like I'm not super risky about things in in, in the coronavirus world but there are certain things that i do i i'm i've played basketball with some friends outside i would never play basketball inside with friends you know i you know i play basketball six blocks from the or, or you know just by the ocean and we have good breeze and i feel okay with that but i made that decision and um but there's times where i see friends where they'll like wear the mask under their nose or they're they do these things. And there's a, a really powerful scene in the novel where Mallory goes to talk to Ron, her friend that runs this, this gas station. And it's a really powerful scene where they make the decision after years of knowing each other to take their blindfolds off and kind of say goodbye to each other because Mallory doesn't, she's taken off with the kids to find yeah. out. And um, so I had the thought because this is something that people are, are doing often now is, is deciding like, you know, there's certain, um, okay, you're a friend. I'm okay with you coming over and we'll sit on the porch or whatever. And we'll have this conversation and people are making these decisions to go without their mask for, for moments at a time. And, uh, I'm getting yeah. smacked right now. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, you love you guys, your dogs. It's fun. You guys gotta go. You guys got dad's in the middle of an interview. Here, you can say hi. There, this is Tuli and Valo. Okay. Hi, doggies. 
You guys gotta go though. You gotta get out of this room, okay? You gotta go be with mom. Go be with mom. Um, <laughs> give me a second. I need to lock them out of here. Give me yeah, one sure. Second. Hold on, everyone. So, so this is a powerful scene in the book where they're deciding to take their blindfolds off, and and I think that whole scene is really emotional for me like and you know he has Ron has the moment where he's like oh you're prettier than I thought you would be <laughs> you know and and she feels safer like for a second like seeing him and saying like oh this is what he looks like and, and 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 the idea of like being friends with somebody or knowing somebody for years and not knowing what their face looks like oh man I know and like not and you know without being blind or without like you've actually hung out with this person and you don't yeah. know what they look like. Yeah. Yeah. And there's Ron Handy sort of like, I think about him sometimes. I'm like, did he go see his sister? Did he go looking for his sister? Did I, I think the answer is probably no way, but that would be a super interesting short story to read, you know, for me yeah. anyway. Like, I don't know. Cause that guy seems like he seems crazy in like a, like a wounded, like like a like shattered way to me. Yeah. Like I see him searching for his sister in almost like brazen fashion. Like if I'm stepping out of the gas station, I'm fucking going for it. I almost can see him wearing a cape, like exiting the gas station with a freaking cape on and like heading on down the road. You know, blindfolded still, but like just like freaking like almost going the distance the other direction. Like if I'm going, I'm going. Yeah. And like almost in a dangerous way. And that'd be like fun to see him. But that was a big moment for me to writing that book because it was, like you said, it was her saying goodbye. Yeah. To where they had been for 10 years. And in a sense, her idea to go for a train or whatever. Yeah. Or meaning whatever, meaning going anywhere for an extended period of time is in a way like out of character in, in a big way out of character is unsafe she could have just been like i don't know how those names are on that paper i am not gonna freaking listen to this if she was as militant as build she would not have gone in search of that train yeah so that was a big moment yeah and, and it's a minute it's a moment where she's letting go for a moment of like her fears and like saying like okay i gotta start taking risks and, and it's funny because and people a lot of times will think that characters, like once they go over a threshold, then, okay, now I'm just going to take risks. It's not like that. It's not, you know, like, yeah, she's taking steps forward, but she's still scared. So she's still yeah. doing these things. And I think it was an important scene to establish that, you know, she's trying to build up the strength to, to do this, to go, to go look for her parents. And um, so I thought that was a really uh, a crucial scene. And I think writers should pay attention to like these foundational moments are really key to driving your narrative as far as like this scene was building character, but it was also world building because it's showing how somebody else has dealt with it. Yeah. And, and, and so you're, you're um, sp spinning a lot of plates in that scene, but I think it, it works really, really well. And that's why Thanks. I'm not sure if non-writers would notice that chapter as strongly as, as the writers would, but I think the writers are going to, are going to see. And I think that another reason why I wanted to highlight that is because um, a lot of times people think that the horror, the horror moments, the parts with the monsters and the attack and the, all those things, are so important for building suspense, but this scene was really important for building suspense too, because it's showing the level of Mallory's fear. It's showing, you know, how hard it is for her to take those steps moving forward. And that's what makes, so then when the train shows up, right, and they go on the train, even the idea of them hearing the train coming, and okay, okay, here's the moment, we're going to try, we have to try and jump on this train. We can't see it, but we're going to have to get on it. Even just the train coming down the tracks becomes more frightening because we've established in the scene with Ron how much fear she has. So, and this is one of the reasons why I like to do these spoiler parts because I like to talk about how you build suspense and, and, 
and Josh, I'm not saying this just to blow smoke up your butt while you're right here with me. I think one of the reasons why Bird Box immediately became a favorite of mine is because I think you're, you, you have an innate talent for building suspense um, through character. And that's what I liked about, and that's what I love about Mallory because I think all these things do that. So let's talk about the train. The train was an interesting thing. Was it early on in the concept of, of, of the book? that they were going to be on the train and that it was going to be this big set piece? No, it wasn't. At some point, um, that was another Allison. Up. Well, but it was an Allison idea because she said to me that um, when I was like first discussing all the options or whatever I might do and have them go somewhere or not, and at one point I thought I might have an entire book, you know, the section in the safer room where Mallory's in the hole. There was a side of me that wanted a whole novel of just like that, like one-on-one -on -one or something. I, I, I know it's impossible or something, but I love that concept, like a, just a standoff almost or something. Yeah. But um, Allison was the one who sort of gave me the train idea. And, we, and she said to me, like, think about it. In a blind world, what um, mode of transportation would be safe? One that is connected to the road. One that is strapped into the road, right? So as long as those tracks are clear. And to make sure of that, you would have to be going slower. So as long as you're not traveling at a speed where an accident would be deadly, and as long as the tracks are most are clear for the most part, a train is totally safe in the bird box world. And I was like, wow, a train and a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these, these are the only two ways you're able to travel. <laughs> you have to travel by, by the Gemini or by the demon drop all the way to New York or something. Anyway, so. <laughs> So that was super exciting to think of it in those terms. Like then, obviously, once once you, you start thinking of um, an established road and all this, then you start thinking, and if it's only going five miles an hour, you can have them on the train for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be easier to get on and off of it if it's traveling that slow. And so it really, Allison was the first one to bring up the train and, and the, all the ideas, they started to fall in dominoes from there. Yeah, and so... Then that presents all the interesting mechanics of the, of like how the cars work, and then there's the really great storyline with the, the rumors that there that somebody has a creature in the last car, and so there's all kinds of fun stuff that's going on there on the train that are building suspense. But for me, and probably my favorite moment in all of Mallory happens on the train and there's a character Dean and he's the character who is running the train and there's um and it's funny because you broke one of the major writing rules in in here but you did it so well which is you're always told to show not tell right and and you know you're not supposed to tell right but my favorite scene in the book is a told part where Dean talks about losing his children and how his children went crazy and how he kept them in the house and he did not let them out and he had them trapped but somehow still in the house they went crazy and absolutely the gut punch of the book my favorite part the part that made me go like this and damn you with jealousy at how great this was <laughs> you know is when he said and because he was calling her Jill at the moment because she was giving him false names. She said, he said, Jill, I never found the sliver. Oh. Meaning, Man. he never found the little thing, the little bit of light of the outside world. And when I read that line, I almost threw the book across the room because I was so jealous. And how <laughs> awesome you had, you had nailed that scene. Because to me... And here's why that is so important. Not only is it like, just you could just hear the pain in his voice. I didn't need an actor to tell me. I saw the words on the page, but I felt it and I almost like heard it. I never found the sliver. And that just, oh, it hurt when I read that. But then, as I kept reading, I thought about Mallory hearing those words. That is her absolute worst fear. <laughs> yes. Totally. 
<laughs> she cannot, she has lived her life terrified that she cannot hide every sliver, every touch, everything she is trying so hard with every moment of her life to protect Tom and Olympia. And that guy just basically said, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. You may not ever be able to protect your child. And that's also a fear every parent has because they're like, no matter what I do, I have to put them out in the world. So tell me about writing that, that scene. Was it? That's, man, thank you for everything you said. And thanks for bringing that scene up. Um, I, writing that scene, I was like, man, this, this poor dude, that moment where he, um, where he, where you understand that he sort of gives up on his own safety even because he's looking for a sliver. I mean, he's looking for what did they see? He's not feeling along the walls. He's, he's on his knees walking at their height, you know, for weeks, he says, or something, days, yeah. weeks. So at that point, you're like, you know, but then there's also, it also sort of, it's interesting, right? Because it implies, like, here's the guy that's in charge of the train that you're on who to tells you that he never found that sliver and also is, somebody might say, admitting that he failed at protecting his kids. So how is he supposed to, how is he going to protect Mallory's, right, on this train? But then the other side of that is, and I think that Tom, her son, Tom, um, uh, relates or pr primed us for Dean because there's a warmth to what Dean says there too, which is what you said, like, at some point there's, there's only so much you can do. I did everything. Yeah. I did everything and it still fucking happened. So it's like, in that case, it's like, why not take the train then? And why not be doing what you're doing? And, yeah. I, and, I, and I think that there's like a warmth in a bizarre, strange way. There's, there's something comforting about that. Like, all right, Mallory, it's almost like Mallory, are you doing all you can? Yes, let's go. All right, and so the lesson I want to impart on other writers out there is that you're constantly told, show, don't tell, okay? But in this moment, you have a character telling a very crucial thing, and it sets forward so much of the suspense throughout the book. So here's the thing. Yes, generally, show, don't tell is a good rule to follow, generally. Yeah. But you can break that rule if you have the right moment. But that works because of how it specifically drives the narrative and the fears of Mallory's forward. Because that line of dialogue informs that story, informs the narrative and the theme of the book. And... It's funny because I'm sure when you were writing it, you weren't thinking, oh, this is the whole fucking book right here. But as a reader and as a reviewer and a critic, when I read that line, I dog-eared the page and said, that's the whole fucking book right there. That's that, is, that, is, that is a hinge on which the door opens. Well, hey, how about this? This is interesting because we've both seen many movies and I don't necessarily fault them, but where an ending may be told instead of shown, like things yeah. are explained, exp there's too much exposition at the end or whatever. Maybe that's why this one works or something for us and for you and, and for me, because it's not at the end. It's not used yeah. to explain everything that's going on. It's a moment of it's telling, up, you know? right. It's a moment of telling on the way to and that's like, there's something like, like imagine that, um, <clears throat> uh, well, never mind. I was, gonna, I, I was about to cite like this other story I wrote, but two guys are in a boxcar together and one of them tells the other one, you know, they're, they're both werewolves who sort of ran into each other, whatever. It's <laughs> pointless to bring this up. But the point is, same thing. It's not explained at the end, but on the way to somewhere else, yeah, you can tell a little instead of showing. And especially... Mallory's getting to know Dean there also. That's another level of it. And also, there's never been in Bird Box or Mallory, Dean's the first time where, where you get some sort of like sense that Mallory may like him sexually. Like a little bit. There's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of like, is Mallory like, like this guy? And so like, there's that in there also. Like, I don't get that in Bird Box, even with Tom, even though 
Like that's, that's one of the things that I love about Tom in the book versus Tom in the movie is that by them not being lovers, to me, it's more harrowing for Mallory to lose someone that she looked up to or like admired, someone that she admired rather than someone that she was romantic with. In the bird box world, it's more harrowing to lose someone that you admire because you admire them because of their philosophy, their take on this, this kind of thing, rather than someone you were intimate with or whatever, right? So she, to me, she always saw Tom the man as, um, what's the right word? Philosophically, someone who admired. But Dean, something about Dean strikes me as, I think Mallory might have liked this guy a little. And that's, that's cause to pause and let him talk about something too. Because maybe us as readers could see like, oh, I can see why she likes him. So in other words, as you said, you know, show, don't tell. But sometimes telling is okay. And, and, and it can serve like a few functions at once. Cool. Sorry, I was being shown a note. <laughs> I was trying okay. to act like I wasn't distracted. Did the, did the but notes I... say, there's a demon behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they did do that Zoom horror movie recently. I didn't watch it, but... Um, and uh, I'm sorry my wife missed your dogs because she would have really enjoyed them. But um, all right, so I got a few more questions, but that was one of the ones that was huge for me because I think that that's so much a huge part of, of what drives this story forward. But um, in, in the last half of the book, Tom, and since we're doing spoilers, so everybody, you know, he creates these glasses that um, are based on mirror shades, basically, that he can look at the creatures. That changes everything in the bird box world. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Because, um, and it's funny because I, uh, there was a thread about Mallory in a science fiction book club that I'm on, <laughs> on Facebook, and I said that I was interviewing you, and the first question that somebody was like, hey, can you ask him if we're ever going to see the creatures if there's another movie, <laughs> right? And I was like, I'll ask, but I think that's a lot like asking Paul Tremblay if, uh, if the possession was real and head full of ghosts, you know? Um, but Tom making these glasses does change the world mm -hmm. because now somebody is going to be able to see the creatures. And the, the, the concept that it's seen the, the cosmic horror, the, the infinity of, of, horror at its very base is what's driving these people crazy is something that we've hinted at it's been theorized and smartly we never seen the creatures before because it could be a lot like the um shark and jaws that's scarier not to see but this changes everything if tom has these glasses and it works we may have to see if the story goes forward we may have to see the creatures in some form or another and we kind of do at the end of the book well right? There's a couple ways of looking at it. Number one, do we know exactly how long it's safe to look at one? Like, so let's say you saw one. Does that mean you're okay? <laughs> right. Or that's a little crazy. crazy. That's like the same. Right. Did something start there? So can I trust your description of them there? Um, yeah. And also, that's sort of like a vaccine in a way too, right? Like, yeah, it was vaccine, vaccine only works so much, yeah. Right. Was the, or, or was the vaccine rushed in Mallory? Like... Like, do, how do we know where someone's going to be a year or a, a week after looking at one, right? So there's that element. There's also, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I would, it would take a lot of, lot of thought or whatever. I have zero plans to extend this anywhere. But I know that I did. One night I got drunk and wrote the ending as if it drove Mallory crazy. And I have that. It's saved in there. I think it's in my desk even. And I was like, ooh, this, this is going to be interesting. What if, like, so at the end she, you know, uses these glasses and it doesn't, no, she goes crazy. Like, what a fucking cellar door slamming shut that would be on this two-book thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I even got, like, emotional about it, and I went outside and talked to Allison after. And then when I came back in, I was like, I, I just can't. I can't do it. And, like, she deserves to see one. Mallory deserves to see one after 17 years in this fucking world. So then I was like, but how do I, how do, how do I show it or how do I describe it? Like what happens after? And I was like, oh, just stop when she looks. Like she starts to look, you know, boom, we're out. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it's a little bit of the of the great minds think alike because um, I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, read Survivor Song yet, uh, Paul Tremblay. Yeah. But, okay, yeah, and um, it's funny because um, there is a, a postlude after this, but there's a similar um, kind of ending to how uh, Survivor Song works before before the postlude, and it was funny because I read your books kind of back. Or close together. I had think I read one in between, but um, the, the, the two books complement each other very well. That's why I'm very excited to, to oh. interview, interview you guys so close to each other. And um, in, in uh, very different books, but um, but uh, complement each other as 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 releases from this summer. And, uh, and 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 what I think is 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 really great is that. Um, the way this book ends, it feels like it's a, it could be a completion. So if you never went back to it, that's great. But you've opened up lots of questions for the future. And I think the questions are good enough that um, I really hope you do continue to do these stories. Yeah. I want Thank you, to, just as a fan, I want you to do some other things and sit on it for a while and think about it. Because I think the time... Um, helps you uh, come up with these things, like just as any writer would. Oh yeah. And so, like, I do hope you come back to that. And, and so, and so the the um, the person that uh, her name is um, Kristen Blake, and she had just finished reading Mallory that, that day, and she sent me a message, and she did say that she really hopes that we get to see the creatures in the next adaptation because the desire to see the see what they look like is so strong um but like me i resist the idea like i don't want to see them like and i i might be a rare fan in bird box but like i feel like the less we see them the better right and Same. yeah yeah and, and and so um but I think Tom's invention kind of means that that we al we almost have to to a certain degree if the story moves forward. But you know, not really. But I, I don't I don't want to tell you. I got no. I don't even tell you. I'm not even no, saying no, that. no. Don't Another. because it's spoilers for the books that we've read. But it's not spoilers for where we go. So so in in, in that regard, I I kind of had a feeling it was like the the is she really possessed question to Paul Tremblay, <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, or, um, you know, I think that lo lots of authors have uh, have had this, um, um, you know, Matheson always had with Somewhere in Time, did he really go back in time or was it all in his mind, you know? And it's like, stop asking him. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Um, I don't want to know that, you know? And, and I think that a lot of that is going on here. So, um all right, so I want to uh, wrap up with um, spoilers for, for Mallory. Um, and uh, I do want to uh, stay afterwards to talk to you for a minute about a few things. But um, for me, this, this book um, did all the things it was supposed to do, which is be a good follow-up to Bird Box, be its own story, uh, be better than the original, um, be which is hard um, because I don't think anything can match that first experience of reading that first 70 pages when I didn't know what it was about. And it's, it's almost impossible to do that when you're doing a story that already has these established rules and these things. But I think he did everything he could do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> with, with that. And it's funny because I admit my first reaction when I saw that Mallory was announced, I was like, you know, and I, I told you this earlier, was like, ooh, man, the pressure. I would not <laughs> want to have to to work. But I think, you know, this is your your world, and and, and um, you know, the weird apocalypse is are is my favorite subgenre. Like I love Levon's The Silence. I love yeah. Um, me too. yeah. <laughs> and and I love um uh uh have you ever read Sip? Um God, what's the author's name who wrote that? It's the one where the monsters sip your shadow. Um Whoa, that sounds amazing. 
Yeah, I'm I'm brain farting that. I got to I got to look it up now since like I mentioned it. Um sip. Um Brian Allen Carr I think wrote it. Um Brian Yes, sip by Brian Allen Carr. Um that's yeah. That was an amazing one. Um yeah, it's monsters who drink your shadow and get your life force. Um, cool. It's it's great. I love the weird apocalypses. So when I read Bird Box, I didn't know what it was going in, and I was so excited because it's like as soon as I figured out it was a weird apocalypse, I was like, hell yeah, um, because it is my favorite subgenre. So you so you had an easy task in the sense that it is my favorite subgenre, <laughs> right? And and I do do love this. Um, this arena but the last thing i wanted to know about the writing of mallory was what was the thing that coming off the movie and coming off the success of the book what was your what was the pressure or the part that that you were most worried about coming into this and how did you attack that biggest fear and in, in, in coming into it? I know that's a big question, but. Well, but I was like, I talked endlessly to Allison at first at least about um, wanting to honor Bird Box. I didn't want to like, how do I explain it? I just didn't want to ruin it. Not ruin it, that's not the right phrase because I wouldn't worry about that, but I just didn't want to like, like change someone's opinion of Bird Box by way of Mallory. And so to do that, I read Bird Box first. And I haven't read that book since, you know, 2013 or something, like seven years ago, you know? And yeah. that book changed my entire life, artistically, financially. Um, I mean, maybe even partly self, my own self-image, my own self-like idea. Mm -hmm. So to return to that book seven years later was like emotional as fuck. I bet. <laughs> And, and what, I, what I was really looking for was sort of the speed of it, the pace of it, as it just like if you were um, gonna write uh, a second song on an album and like just to make sure that it was in step, you didn't want it to be too much slower or faster than the first one. And so that was what I was looking for mostly and I was a bit stunned by it. I was like, whoa, Bird Box moves like fast. And I, I didn't remember it being that way. And um, so I then- I think you've hit on too. That's one of the best feelings as a writer when you go back to a draft of something you haven't read in a long time and it's better than you remember. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you have yeah. that in your and life. As, like a musician, I'm very, 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 very aware of the speed, the tempo of each of these books. And then, like, I understand Carol's a slower song or something, but I fucking love slow songs in right. books also. So, but with with Mallory, I was like, okay, we got to find, it sounds ridiculous to say the beats per minute or something, but I just wanted to find the rhythm. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I just wanted to find the pacing and the rhythm. And I believe by the end of Bird Box, I got it. And I was like, okay, no, I got it. I got it. And I said to Allison, I was like, I, I understand Bird Box. I, I can do this. But had I not read that, I don't think Mallory would have would have lined up in the way that it did or something. So to answer your question, the thing I was most afraid of was or aware of was honoring Bird Box. And I think, oh, well, the simple way is just to read it. Yes, but to read it, almost read like through it, like not the language necessarily, not the events, but the feel behind it. Yeah. I feel like I got that with Mallory. Well, and, and then the question becomes too, because when you think about like Stephen King returning to uh, do Dr. Sleep after years of, you know, I'm sure he had to go back and read The Shining and you know, and, and what he ended up with was The Shining is a book about alcoholism and Dr. Sleep is a book about recovery, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and um, in, in the sense of um, Bird Box is a book about the world ending and Mallory is a book about living with the paranoia of the world Indeed. before and after. And we're, we're, we're all dealing that with that right now because there's a before coronavirus and there's an after coronavirus because it's not as dramatic, right? But at the same time, I think it's a book for the today because, um, unintentionally, but it's a book for today because 
you know, Bird Box is about like, we have to live with this new reality or, or the reality is crushing us and it's falling on us. And Mallory is a book about we have to live with this new reality. Yeah. It's, it's the difference between the month where everything's closed and what the fuck are we going to do? And the, like, now, now we debate whether we wear blindfolds or not. I think also, and I think what you just said is definitely more on point, but it's also Bird Box is Mallory is a mother and Mallory is Mallory is a daughter. Not entirely, but that strain is there. Not, obviously not entirely, but I see that too. And in a strange way, that makes like a wonderful mirror. It's almost to me, the books go, in a strange way, the books can mirror each other in that way. Um, Tom the boy, Tom the man, right? Um, yep. Hoodie, blindfold, mother, daughter, right? All these things. Um, so, yeah. All right. Um, Josh Mallerman, it was amazing to like actually meet you in person. Mm -hmm. We talked online a couple times before. Yeah. But, um, it's uh, uh, really an honor to talk to you about the process of this book. I loved it. I, um, you know, I think it's a fantastic sequel and um, I really um, think there's a lot to learn about suspense and tension and building and, and um, combining uh, world building with, um, with uh, all the mechanics of how it works. A great nuts and bolts behind the scenes. Um, and uh, speaking of somebody who has been, that read Bird Box when it came out, um, the amazing phenomenal success that it had in the memes was really fun to watch. Um, it was cool when my coworkers were saying to me, you were telling me about that book last year. Yeah. <laughs> that was really exciting. And I'm like, yeah, you should start listening to me for book recommendations. And I did have a friend who read um, Pimborough's Behind Her Eyes because she said, what's the next book that, that's going to hit? And I was like, well, there's going to be a Netflix show of this. Oh, dude. And and that book is great, man. That book totally messed me up. I, I was, I read it uh, in ARC of it. Yeah. And that ending, I was like, wait a minute, wait, is it? I was like, no way. How, how can you surprise someone these days? And she totally pulled that off. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Pimbro is a, a genius. And, uh, uh, yeah, I love her, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's funny because, like, when people were like, it's funny in a weird way when people were saying, what's the next bird box? That was the one that I, what I think they were looking for is what's the next one that you read as a book that you can tell me about before it becomes like this big thing. Yeah. And, and uh, because people remembered me talking about bird box, you know, before they became a movie. So everyone kept, it was so funny. The, the aftermath of bird box for me, when it, the movie was everyone coming to me saying what to read next. You know, oh my god, but think about it like it gave me credibility, dude. Dude, every book you've mentioned in this, um, I mean, of course, the, the, you and I know this, but every book you've mentioned in this um, experience has been like an awesome or why the fuck wouldn't you read it from, from Three Stigmata when, when we were first talking up to Paul's new book to Sarah to, I mean, literally, oh, I'm gonna, I wrote down Sick, yeah, yeah. and I wrote down another one too that you said. Where did I put that? <laughs> well, look, um, one of the missions for me in doing this is that um, I, you know, as being a writer who does not have the level of success that you do, <laughs> but in, where I'm at now, I believe that the book of sphere is something that you have to, it's something that if you, it's about karma, like you have to promote the books that you're reading because yes. you want to be a part of that. And, and I think that, authors in your stage get to do that through doing blurbs and I discovered by reviewing the books that I was doing because I've got over a thousand book reviews on my blog is that I yeah I learned that by reviewing every book good or bad liked it or didn't like it by reviewing every book that I was learning more about the book than I was if I just read it right huh that when I was breaking it down, like, I don't know if I just read Mallory without the, the intention of doing the book review, if I would have broke down the, the sliver scene, for example. That's interesting. I'm, hmm. Yeah. I'm going to think about that because I don't, I um definitely talk about the books I'm reading. But yeah. I'm hesitant to review because my, 
Dude, I don't know, man. It's not for everybody, but but I think that learning for every reader to figure out ways to give in to the book sphere and to give back and to figure out how to process these books because, you know, it's one thing for Stephen King to say, writers read, we agree, but you can't just read, you have to digest books and I think you have to learn from them. And that's one of the reasons why for me, like it's a, it's an honor to do these podcasts because I'm like, I get a chance to, I lived under the hood of your book when I was reading it. And it's really awesome to be able to like share those moments. And I hope for other people to listen they get as much out of it and i'm um gonna continue to uh interview as many authors as i can here and uh so so if you've listened this far people subscribe to my to my podcast and uh postcards from a dying world read the blog i do a monthly digest of reviews of everything that i read to audio so you don't have to read all my reviews you can just plug it in your ear hole that's and, cool yeah, and Josh, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything you've done for the horror community. Um, it's awesome to have a great new voice uh, to add. You know, it's funny because I've been thinking about updating my top 10 horror novels of all time because I did it on my blog like 10 years ago. And I was like, oh, it's time to update it. And it's awesome to have somebody come out that who, when I did the last top 10, didn't exist, wasn't there, and is able to crack the list because of the amazing work that you've done. Uh, I think Tim LeBond's The Silence is gonna get up there too. That- He's so good, man. That He's chapter so with the dog, I never good. thought a chapter with a dog could outdo I Am Legend or match it. He's and, so good, yeah. And that's one of the things that, no offense to the movie, but they just did not get that scene right in the movie. And that chapter with the dog in The Silence is one of the most horrifying and brutal chapters that I've ever read. It broke me. It fucking broke me, Josh. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like Tim, like, you could just feel it. Every sentence seemed like he had it. Like, he just he had it. Like, in zone with he, that. I read um, Eden also was fantastic. Oh, I'm looking forward to that, yeah. The, the silence had, like, you could just tell that he he had it, man. I don't want to stop yeah. that thing. It's like, he's always good. And everything he writes, like we were talking before, you're like, Carol might not be the one for you, whatever. But, you know, it's it, anything Tim writes is going to be great. But the silence, like, there's something inspired going on there. Where every yeah. fucking line, I'm like, Jesus, man. This guy's he's like, a, he's like a drummer who's in the zone, you know? Yeah, he's in the zone. I wrote him during it many times. I'm like, this, is this isn't good. This is unbelievable. Yeah. You know? He's one of the best horror novels I've ever read. I kept yeah. writing him that. And I and I hope, you know, hope he sees this and, and, and hears us both saying that. Oh, we'll have to tag him on it. So make yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll tag him on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll have to do that. All right, Josh. Well, um, thanks for joining us on the show. And yeah. um, and uh, we'll make sure that everybody um, uh, reads Mallory and uh, um, spreads the good word. Um, I'm sure it's doing fine, but um, let's do everything we can to help it. And uh, thanks for joining me.